Miss Betty doesn't get older, she just gets sweeter. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you open them to Romans chapter 3? On Sunday morning, we're in a brand new sermon series we started a couple of weeks ago, entitled Questions and Answers. You ask the questions, I'll give you the Bible answers. Bible questions have Bible answers. I'm not going to give you what I think or feel. I'm not going to give you what I theorize. I'm not going to give you what I guess. I'm not going to give you what I speculate. I'm not going to give you what I might want to tell you. I'm going to give you the Word of God. Your questions deserve to be answered, and they will be answered from the Word of God. In just a moment, we're going to begin reading Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. But for right now, just one scripture we'll read, and that's verse 23 of Romans 3. A well-known verse to most of you. What we're reading is the words of the Apostle Paul writing to the audience of his day, writing to you and I this morning. And he makes a statement. You got your eyes on your Bible? For most have sinned. For a majority have sinned. A high percentage have sinned. Ivory soap has sinned. 99.9. No, that ain't what he says. Every word in the Bible is important. It's not just there to fill space. Paul, writing under the inspiration of God's Holy Spirit, says to you and I and to all who will hear, all have sinned. What is the definition of all? All. Everyone. All have sinned. All have fallen short of the glory of God. Through the years, particularly over the last decade, a number of polls and surveys have been taken of what God's people think, what religious people think about various topics. And one of the topics that has been asked lately, particularly by George Barna, but other people as well, is the subject of salvation. How can you be saved? Can you be saved by your goodness? Can you be saved by your good works? Does goodness play any part in salvation? Does good works play any part in salvation? Can you be saved by being good? Can you be saved by doing good things? Or if you can't be saved by them, at least can you add to your salvation or complete your salvation by such behavior? Many people believe that you can. That you can be saved or add to or complete your salvation by being good, whatever good may be, and doing good things, whatever those good things may be. There's many people today who believe that heaven is a reward for being good. Not a gift of God to those who are bad. There are many people today who believe that while Jesus' death on the cross was important, it was helpful. We can also, through our goodness and good works, save ourselves as well. You might be one of those who believe that. The only problem with these beliefs that goodness or, or good works can add to or complete your salvation or even give you salvation in a part of Jesus Christ the only problem with the belief is that it's a reward for people who are good. The only problem with, with Jesus being important and helpful on the cross, but not really relevant to our salvation. The only problem with believing that, look up here at me, is it's a belief that is wrong. 
And we have a generation of people who call themselves Christians who have no clue what's right and wrong. Because they've been taught whatever you think is truth, whatever you feel is right. But that's not what the Bible teaches. There is a way which seems right unto a man, says the Scriptures. There is a way which a man believes to be right. But the end of that way is destruction and death. What do the scriptures teach about salvation before we go to our text? Well, the scriptures both in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, in the Old Testament and the New Testament, under the law and under grace, they all teach the same thing. In the Old Testament, they look to the cross and to Jesus who would die for their sins, for their salvation. We look back to the cross, to Jesus who died for our sins as well. So what do the scriptures teach? What do we need to believe real quick to counteract, to contradict the beliefs that are out there that goodness and good works, among a lot of other things, can save you? First of all, we need to understand this. First of all, we're sinners. We're sinners. Until you come to understand that you are a sinner, you will never need a Savior. Until you understand you've got cancer, you will never go to a doctor to be treated for that cancer. You see... We need to understand who we are. And the Bible clearly says we're sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're sinners by nature. We're born into this world with a sin nature. We later become sinners by choice as we exercise the free will that God gave us, but yet we do it under sinful tendencies. We do not sin to become sinners. We sin because we are sinners. We do not steal to become a thief. The reason we steal is we are thieves. We are rotten to the core. You say, Pastor Joel Osteen wouldn't say that. The Bible says that. And we'll leave it there. So, on this thing of goodness and good works, we need to understand... We have all sinned against God. We might have sinned against other people. We might have sinned against ourselves. We might have sinned against this nation and our church and our home. Because righteousness exalts a nation, but wickedness will bring it down. But most of all, we've sinned against God. All sin is against God. So we're sinners, but secondly, our sin has separated us from God. And sentenced us to death. God is a holy God. He's over here. We're a sinful people. We're over here. And never the twain can meet. God cannot be around sinfulness. And we cannot stand his holiness. You see, we're separated from God. And there is a gulf that is impassable from where we're at. And we're sentenced to death. You know what the truth of the matter is? Because we're sinners, we're on death row. Spiritual death row awaiting execution. Which will occur when we die. So that's the truth of the matter. Isaiah the prophet says, your iniquities have separated you from God. This is an Old Testament prophet speaking. Your your iniquities have separated you from God. Your sins have hidden His face from you. Paul later says in Romans 6, the wages of sin. You are a sinner. I am a sinner. What's the penalty? What's the, the, the consequence of being a sinner? The wages of sin is death. Ultimately, that's where you're going to go if you stay in a sinful state and bring it to its conclusion. Now, I just told you some bad news. I know you don't like bad news. But listen, unless you got bad news, there's no good news. We give an unbalanced gospel. We want to tell everybody God loves them, put your faith in Jesus, and go to heaven. 
We say it's the good news. Well, why is it the good news? It's only the good news because if we don't do that, we are sinners on our way to a devil's hell. So you have to have the, the bad news to have the good news. The good news, ladies and gentlemen, is there is a way to be saved from our sins. And that is through faith in a risen Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man would boast. God in his love, God in his grace, God in his mercy says, I love you. I never meant for you to go to this place of hell. It was created for Satan. It's a prison for him. It's a prison for his demons. I never meant for you to go there. I sent my son into this world. I put him on a cross. He took your sins upon himself on that cross. My son who was sinless took your sin upon himself. He paid for your sin in full with the shedding of his blood, with the giving of his life. He died for your sins on that cross. Not his, yours. He was buried with your sins. He arose again with victory over your sins. And through him you can have a new life. You can have a fresh start. You can have a new beginning. Your past can be forgiven. Your present can be forgiven. Your future can be forgiven. Not because you're good. Not because you've done good things. But because of him. What he's done for you, you put your faith in who he is. He is God. And you put your faith in what he did. He died for you. And he died for me. Now we're talking about, you say, Pastor, you're, you're kind of wandering around a little bit. No, I'm not. I'm going to bring you back. Okay, I'm, not, I'm not crazy. Well, I might be crazy. I'll take that back. But I know what I'm doing crazy. Can we be saved by being good? Can we be saved by good works? Well, the Bible says all of sin and come short of the glory of God. All of us who are sinners, all of us who are sinners, we're separated from a holy God and we're under the death watch. We're on spiritual death row awaiting to be executed the moment we close our eyes in death, if we stay in that state. But God loves us. He sent Jesus into this world. And Jesus Christ died on the cross for the sins of the world. For God so loved the world. That's not the planet. That's the people. For God so loved the people of this world that he gave heaven's best. He gave the prince of heaven, Jesus Christ. He gave him for, to die for our sins. That if we would believe in him, put our faith in him, we would not perish but have everlasting life. And then there's one other point to go with that. See, this is theology, folks. I, I, I know some of you say that. I, I'm all confused. No need to be confused. This is simple. Fourthly, there's nothing else that can save us. You say, but what about goodness? There's nothing else that can save us. What about good works? There's nothing else that can save us. What about philosophy? What about religion? There's nothing else that can save us. What about ordinances and sacraments and rituals, ceremonies? There's nothing else that can save us. What about what I believe, sincerely believe? What about I, I, my feelings, Pastor, my feelings? There's nothing else that can save you. Nothing else. You say, I don't like that. I like choices. Well, you take it up with Jesus if you go where he's at. Because it was Jesus who said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. Nobody's going to the Father which is in heaven, lest they go through me. And my way is right there. And by the way, I, I want you to understand in the book of John, Jesus says, I am continually. You see, there were people in that day who doubted his deity. We have their cousins alive today who do the same thing. 
Listen to me and look up here at me. Jesus was God Almighty. I am God Almighty. I am the way. I am God Almighty. I am the, the life. I am God Almighty. I am the truth. I am God, he says. And I'm telling you as God, there is no other way except through me. So get it down big, plain, and straight. No stutter, no stammer. Let me say it loudly, clearly, and plainly. We are not saved by being good, no matter how good you may be. We are not saved by good works, no matter how many good works you may do. We are saved by the Lord's goodness toward us and His great work of redemption at a place called Calvary. So, Pastor, goodness can save me? Yes, His goodness. Works can save me? Absolutely. His works on your behalf and my behalf that took place at Calvary. Titus 3, when the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, it appeared not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy. He saved us. So you got it? Jesus is the only way. But He is God's way. If you come to Him by faith, you can be saved. You can have a life changed down here and your place in eternity changed forever. Now I'm going to close out this message by letting the Apostle Paul teach you in a seminary class. I, when I was in seminary, I had some great seminary teachers, but they have declined to come today. I've got a great staff, and they can know how to shuck the corn too when it comes to teaching and preaching the Bible. But I didn't ask them because they didn't want to do it either. And we've got some great preachers in this church. And by the way, for our summer series on Moses, you're going to see some of them up here on this pulpit, live and in color. But I didn't ask them either. Because I knew that we had somebody who would come and speak today who's the greatest Christian man who ever lived. He was taught by God himself in the desert of Arabia, the theology that he would later pass on to us through his writing of half the New Testament. Paul the Apostle, a man so radically and dramatically changed that when God saved him, God not only changed his nature, God changed his name. Saul of Tarsus became the Apostle Paul. We're going to let him teach us some theology now from Romans chapter 3. Because I want you to see things with your own eyes, not just always take it that Pastor Jim said it, so it's got to be true. I will tell you the truth, but I want you to see it with your own eyes. So Romans chapter 3, beginning with verse 10. The Apostle Paul begins his class. And by the way, Sam's on the front row of the class. He's going to begin his class by telling us our condition. Once again, if you don't know your condition, how can you be, get any help for it? So he tells us without any problem, this is who we are. Look at verses 10 through 12. He talks about our condition. There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. What he does immediately is he refutes the argument that you can be good and save yourself. He says there's nobody good. So that takes that off the table. He says in these verses that none of us are righteous, none of us understand righteousness, none of us seek after righteousness, none of us do righteousness. We're all infected by this disease called sin. It's infested us, it's infected us. 
to the core of our being. If you're a Jew, you have the problem. If you're a Gentile, you have the problem. If you're a moralist, you have the problem. If you're an immoralist, you have the problem. If you're a religionist, you have the problem. If you're a pagan, a heathen, you have the problem. If you're a Clemson Tiger, you have the problem. And if you're a South Carolina Gamecock, you have the problem. If you're you, you have the problem. If you're me, you have the problem. If you're the Citadel, you have the problem. And if you're Charleston Southern, you have the problem. What's the problem? None of us are righteous. We don't want to be righteous. We resist every effort by Him to make us righteous. We are wicked to the core, and we enjoy being wicked to the core, and we don't want to change. But God loves us. He loves us so much that He will not allow us to stay as we are. He will come after us. Our condition. Now, we may not all be equally sinful, but we're all equally sinners. Some worse than others, but we're all sinners. That's our condition. Now look at verse 13 and 14. You got your Bibles open. Because we are sinners, we talk like sinners. Now, maybe not all the time like this, But sometimes we talk like this privately. Sometimes we talk like this publicly. Sometimes we talk like this and we never open our mouth because we talk from our heart. What what, what is our conversation? Verse 13 and 14. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asp, that snakes, is under their lips. Verse 14, their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Our condition, we're sinners and we enjoy being sinners. We don't want to change. We're perfectly happy letting it play out and rolling the dice and go into eternity thinking somehow we're going to escape what the Bible says we're going to face. And because we're sinners, we talk like sinners. We're inclined to speak profanity and vulgarity at times. I mean, not all the time, but when we get mad, we let it fly. Somebody cuts in front of us leaving the church. We're working on something in the backyard, and we're, pow. we're not as bad as we could be, but we're bad. Negativity and nastiness comes out of our mouth. Hurtfulness and cruelty comes out of our mouth. Gossip and lies comes out of our mouth. Paul says it like this. He says, what comes out of your mouth is like the toxins and poisons that comes out of a snake, a poisonous snake. What comes out of your mouth is just what it's like when you see you open up a casket and there's a decaying corpse in it. He says the words of an unsaved man reflect his condition. He's got poisonous words. He's got decaying words. That's why when God created us, he gave us teeth. Now, some of you got more than others, admittedly. But he gave us teeth. You know why? Teeth are not only for chewing food, but teeth are a picket fence to keep our tongue in. Because when our tongue gets out, our tongue can do great damage. That's what James said. So our conversation reflects our condition. Notice in verse 15 through 17, our condition reflects not only our conversation, how we talk, but it affects our conduct, how we walk. Look, verse 15 through 17, their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. What Paul says is, In our condition as sinners, we're murderers. You say, I've never murdered anybody. Have you wished you could? Jesus said, if you hate somebody in your mind, you're already guilty according to the law, his law. 
you're already guilty of actually murdering them. If you lust after somebody in your heart, though you might never touch that person, the fact that you lusted after them, in Jesus' law, you've already committed adultery. So Jesus didn't come to abolish the moral law. He came to elevate it. Because the Pharisees walked around and said, we're good. We don't need salvation. We're good. We don't say this and we don't do that. And Jesus said, well, I beg your pardon. You do. You think it. You feel it. You do it on the inside. And if you could get away with it on the outside, you'd do it there. He says, we're murderers. We're killers. We're like wild animals. We're like crazy sociopath, or psychopaths. We slaughter our own kind. Notice verse 18. See how this is unfolding. You have a condition. It's sinful. It shows in the way you talk. It shows in the way you walk. It also shows in the attitude that you have toward God about it. Look at verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. These people who are in this condition, and who are these people, by the way? Hold up a finger. Who's these people? You. You and me. We're part of these people. These people, they stick their middle finger up in the air at God. We're sinners. Do something about it. We're going to say this. Do something about it. We're going to do this. Do something about it, God. God, we dare you. The audacity, the arrogance of foolish people who are wicked on top of it. Notice verse 19. Where does it all of this go? Our condition, our conversation, our conduct, our complacency, which is nothing more than arrogance toward God. Our condemnation, verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Pastor Jim, that was a wonderful sermon this morning. Thank you so much. You really gave it to him. Sir, I gave it to you too. I really gave it to you, didn't I? You got it. <laughs> I gave it to me too. You see, we all like to pass the buck. And Paul says we're under condemnation in verse 19. He says there will come a day when you will open your mouth and try to deny what God says you are and what you've done. And God will shut your mouth when he shows up on the screen. Every thought you ever thought, every feeling you ever felt, every word you ever spoke, every act you ever did, he'll put it right up there and say, answer me for that. And we will go, ah, wah, ah, wah, ah, wah, ah, ah, ah. we'll have nothing to say, says Paul. Our condemnation. Guilty. Take them away. God so loved us. God commended his love toward us that while we were yet sinners and everything I just told you, Jesus died for us on a cross. He died for us on a cross. And if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved out of that condition. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Does that include me, Pastor? Some people say, only certain people that includes. It includes you. Whosoever, that's you, that's me. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord, places their faith in Christ when they call upon the name of the Lord, repents of their sin when they call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. Not question mark, exclamation point. Not maybe, could be, might be, hope be. You will be saved. So now it's test time before we leave. 
pop test, take out your pencil and paper, answer these questions, they're easy, softball questions if you've been listening. Question number one, can being good save you? She blurted out the answer. <laughs> That's okay. Some of you were happy they blurted it out, weren't you? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Can doing good deeds save us? Can religion save us? Can being genuine and sincere save us? Who saves us? Jesus. Who saves us? Is there any other way to be saved outside of Jesus? See, I could have started the sermon with that and you'd been mad because then we went home. Now you know the basis for reason of that. Salvation is by God's grace through our faith in a risen Christ. Him alone. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. And by the way, what the Lord gives, He keeps, and He finishes. I know some people do not believe in eternal security, and I don't believe in it either if you're not eternally secure. But if you have a real relationship with Jesus that is life-changing and soul-saving, He not only will justify you the moment you're saved, he will give that to you. But He will keep that salvation through the process of sanctification till He finishes that salvation in heaven with glorification. What the Lord gives, if He gives it, not if Pastor Jim gives it, or a church gives it, or a rabbi or a priest gives it. What He gives through His Son Jesus and the person of the Holy Spirit, what He gives he keeps and He finishes. Salvation is all of Him. All we do is one thing. You say, Pastor, what's that? I'll let the little boy tell you. His Sunday school teacher just got through teaching the lesson on salvation. And the little boy said, Sir, I'm so glad Jesus and me saved me. And his teacher said, Wait a minute. You didn't hear what I said. The little boy said, I heard you, sir. I heard you. I'm saved, and Jesus and me saved me. <laughs> the teacher said, what in the world are you talking about? The little boy said, let me tell you, I did all the sinning, and he did all the saving. <laughs> Aren't you glad of that? Yeah, we contributed. We contributed the sin, and he gave us the salvation. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed.